so glad to see y'all this morning. Hope y'all are ready to come and praise Jesus this morning before we hear his word. So if y'all please stand up. We're going to sing, O Come All Ye Faithful. Father, Lord God, we come before your holy throne and we bow before you and we worship you. And Father, even as we sing this song, let us come adore. Father, let us always come before your throne room and adore you and your son. Father, we're so thankful that a loving God would send his only begotten son to be born, Father, to walk a perfect sin-free life, to die on a cross for the atonement of our sin. Father, you are an amazing God, and we bow before you and we worship you. We are so thankful for your love, your, your watch care, your mercy, your long-suffering, your kindness, your goodness that you have bestowed upon each one of us. Oh, Father, we ask that today that all that we do and say brings glory and honor unto you. And Father, we ask that you would move inside this service today and that you would be glorified and only you would be glorified. We ask this in the name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. God is good. All and all the time. Amen, amen. I got a few announcements this morning. First off, uh, the pictorial directory, we're making some updates to it. If your picture needs to be updated, your address has changed, your email, your phone number, uh, right after service on that back wall, right before those new doors out there, uh, Jack and Kate will be out there, uh, and so stop by and get your picture made or your update your information. We would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Also, there's our cards. Folks, if you just send out Christmas cards, we've got a place that you can bring them to everybody in the church, and you can put them in a the little mailbox that we have, right where you come in the back of, in the, back of the foyer there. There's a place for you to come and put in cards. If you want to send Christmas cards, it saves you the postage. But let me tell you something. You need to go pick up your card. So stop by, look at your last name, and see if anybody brought you any Christmas cards, okay? Amen? Amen. If not, we're going to end up with a bunch of Christmas cards on January 1st here at the church. We don't want that. We want you to have those. So stop uh, and pick up the ones that are yours. All right. Next Sunday evening, we are going to have a business meeting at 6 o'clock. 
uh, to go over our budget for next year. And so we'll approve our budget. They're in the back uh, on the little table. There's a copy of the budget if you wanted to get it and kind of read through it and see where it is. And then next Sunday night, we will come and we will talk about it and we will vote on it. So please make plans to come to the business meeting, but also stop and get your copy of next year's budget uh, in the back. All right, La yesterday, Scott, we had a group that went over and uh, handed out blankets, uh, and I heard that it went really, really good, and uh, that y'all had a good turnout, and a lot of people were blessed by it, amen? Uh, I would like to thank everyone that brought blankets and the ones that went. Scott gave me such a great report and said, it, he said, Josh, I was blessed so much more than the people that I took the blanket to. And folks, I'm telling you, that's what happens. Whenever you walk in and just give somebody a small gift that are people that don't get, a lot of times they don't get a lot of visitors. You just stop in and spend some time and talk to them and pray for them. Uh, it will bless your heart. So thank you to everyone who did that. All right, December 22nd, we're having our candlelight uh, Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And so I encourage you to make plans to come at 6.30 on the 22nd here at the church. Folks, it's a special, special service uh, where all of our families will come to the altar and we all pray and we bring our gift for the Lottie Moon offering. But folks, I love the Lottie Moon and I love the work that they do, but I enjoy watching our families praying together that night. So please come uh, as a special time uh, of year as we will do our Lottie Moon Christmas offering at 630 on December 22nd. All right, if you're any kids with us that want to go to Children's Church, y'all are now dismissed. If you can go right over here, I hope somebody's out there waiting. Marge is going to go just to make sure. Thank you, Miss Marge. Any other kids that want to go to Children's Church, uh, please go this way, and hopefully somebody's out there to take care of you. There is, I'm sure. <laughs> if not, we'll send Billy Peavy. Where is she? Uh, all right. Uh, if you're a guest with us, in your chair pocket in front of you is a card that looks something like this. If you would, just take that and fill that out and drop it in the offering plate as you leave as we would just have, like to have a record of your attendance where we would like to thank you for being here. And with that, I would ask you would stand and I'll turn it back over to Brother Seth. Y'all please stand with us. So bless the Lord, oh my soul. Worship His holy 
our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I 
will not be overcome And through the valley of the shadow I will not fear And I am not alone I am not alone You will go before me Please take a moment and bow your head. Pray for the circle. for leading us in worship. I love that song there. We are, we are not alone. Aren't we blessed that we are not alone? God is, will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen? But I will tell you, the song that uh, we sang about being in heaven and uh, Christ taking us by the hand and leading us through the promised land, what a, what a day that will be. Amen? But folks, at the same time, I would tell you, this week we lost one of our founding members of the church, Brother Paul Cobb. Uh, and uh, as we sang that song, I was reminded that that's where he is right now, in heaven in glory. But be praying for uh, the Cobb family. Be praying for Ruth Ann uh, as there's so much on her plate right now and all that she's going through. But I will tell you, Brother Paul was in a lot of pain 
Uh, and when we sang that, song, that line there about no, no more pain, I thought, I'm so thankful that Brother Paul is no longer in pain. Amen? Hey, we will have information about the service uh, later on. It will probably uh, not be until January. Uh, I talked to the family yesterday, so anybody wanting to know, it'll be sometime in January when we will have a service for uh, our dear loved one. Uh, all right, we're preaching through Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter 26. I took two weeks to, to kind of look at the last passage uh, uh, where you had this woman who had poured this uh, very costly fragrant over Christ. Uh, and the first week we talked about giving up our most precious possession. And my challenge to the church and to you individually was, have you given your most precious possession to him? Whatever it is. And are you, are you giving your very best or are you giving your junk? And I use the illustration about how sometimes we bring our junk to church. And, and I challenge you to be bringing your very best. And last week we looked at the way that the, the disciples responded to what happened. And remember, they got indignant. In fact, they got very angry and upset about what had just happened. And I took that time to kind of give us maybe a proper view of, of how to handle money. Folks, money is important. And it's important that we, uh, as the children of God, understand what God says about money. And the first thing I pointed out is, guess what? God owns it all. Amen? It's not ours anyway. Folks, if it's not yours, you don't have to worry about holding on to it too tight. Amen? You can use it for his glory, for his kingdom, for his work. Because he says it's his anyway. The second thing that I, I pointed out was about giving and, and the importance of, of your tithes and your offerings and, and what that means. And then the third thing that I pointed out was the love of money and what the, how dangerous it is whenever you love money uh, and the harm that it could be. Because that's what had happened to the disciples. And they justified their actions because they said, oh, we could have used that money to give to the poor. Folks, they were just justifying a root that was inside of them that was dangerous. Uh, we're going to continue our study through the book of Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter 26. Today we're going to be reading a small portion, just uh, a few verses in verses 14 through 16. So uh, if you will, please rise as we read Matthew chapter 26, verses 14 through 16. Rise for the reading of God's word. As we pick up this story. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. And so from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Father, Lord God, the time has come for the preaching of your word. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit, the one that your word inside your word tells us will lead us into all truth, the one that your word says will guide us, the one that your word says dwells with inside your believers, I pray that your Holy Spirit would control my heart, my mind, and my tongue. Oh, Father, I pray that so that this message would be directed of you and not of me. Father, I'm thankful for what you've done in my heart as, as we spent time preparing this message, but at the same time, I ask that regardless of what's on a note that that, Father, that I'm yielded to you and that you would use this time to communicate to this group of believers what you would have them to hear. Father, I do pray that every person here would open up their heart and their mind to hear from you today. That everyone here, even right now, would say, Lord, Holy Spirit, speak to you. That each person would be willing to open themselves. Because, Father, I... I believe that so many people have already read this text and know this story. But Father, we let us, let us look at what happened here. Let it penetrate our hearts. And Father, may when, we, may when we leave here today, Father, may we be changed because we've been touched by you. Oh, Father, I pray that you would draw someone closer into you today. Father, maybe there's somebody here that does not know 
our Lord, our Savior. Maybe today would be the day of their salvation. Father, I ask that you would move inside this place. We ask this name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. I'll just tell you, I was thinking about this service just a minute ago when we were sitting over there during worship, and I will tell you, I, I, and some of y'all might know this about me, I like sad movies. I watch sad movies. I, 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 I don't know what it is, but there are, when a movie really grips you and it, it captures you, I, there's something about watching a movie that, uh, would make you cry. In fact, I don't know if any of y'all have ever watched the movie The Notebook, but man, that movie can get me every time. I remember one time I was, Candy and I were taking the kids to Colorado and we were driving and Candy was reading a book and so I just told her, I said, well, why don't you just read the book out loud to me? And it was a book that was called Learning to Breathe uh, and it was by Tammy Trent. Uh, and uh, she had started this book, and I was like, well, it's 14 hours. I might as well have my wife read to me. Amen? I didn't, I didn't know how sad this book was going to be, and I'm driving and just crying, and my kids are in the back, and they're crying, but they're for a different reason. But, um, <laughs> but I'm listening to this story, and I thought, how sad, how sad this event that took place inside this lady's life. I was thinking about how, how many sad stories there are inside Scripture. There are stories inside Scripture, folks, that if, if, we would, if we would break out and actually think about what takes place inside these stories, they would absolutely break your heart. You take the story of David and Bathsheba. Instead of just reading that story for a story that's inside Scripture, if you read that story for actually, in, in it being somebody's life, and then what happened because of this adulterous relationship that led to murder, that also the loss of a son and all the turmoil that goes on inside of this family that could have probably been prevented if they just would have made a better decision. It's heartbreaking. It's sad. I think about the story of Joseph being sold into slavery. One of the saddest scriptures I've always said in all of, all of God's word, there's a story in the book of Acts. And it's a story that has always hurt me to read the story. It's a story by the name, by, about the, this guy by the name of King Agrippa. Paul goes and he preaches to this king. And, and he, he just preaches Christ crucified to him. And he preaches as hard as he can to him. And at the very end, the king, the, the leader there, King Agrippa, says these words. You almost persuaded me. Folks, that is so heartbreaking. It is so sad. This king was right on the verge of surrendering his life to Jesus Christ, and that would have changed him forever. But he said, you almost persuaded me. Folks, whenever you read scriptures, there's so many things inside scripture that is sad. But I will tell you, I don't know of any more sad story than the one that we look at today. All those stories have always been at the top of my list whenever I think of sad things that happen inside God's Word. But as I started studying this text and realizing, and, and folks, I have known it logically, but whenever you really start thinking about what takes place inside these two short verses, it is so incredibly sad. In fact, I will tell you, as I started preparing this, 
this message and I started thinking about the weight of what has, is taking place inside these two verses. I thought, I've got to be able to break this down. So I'm going to try to break this down for us to look at so that, so that we grasp what is going on. But as I did that, folks, I couldn't even get past the first five words inside of the text. If you look what it says, then one of the twelve. The very first, those first five words. Then as I, I begin to even dive even more into it, I said, I can't even get past the first word. Y'all see that first word? Y'all see that first word that's written there inside this text? What is that word? Then. I sat there and I just looked at that word, then. You see, you say, Josh, why, why, why did it matter about that word then that caused you to, to really pause and to think about it? It's because that word then means it came after something. There was an event that had taken place and then something happened. So what had just happened? What came before this? What came before this is this. A lady gave the most precious possession she had to Jesus. Then this happened. What had happened just before this? Jesus had just told them that this is for my burial. Then this happened. What had happened before this? Jesus had just told them that what this lady did would be a memorial for her. Then this guy did this. Oh, see, whenever, whenever I sat here and you put this in, in, in context or perspective, you see that all of this good stuff had just went on. And when all this good stuff had just gone on, then someone makes a, de a decision to do something completely opposite of the good stuff that had just happened. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Whenever you look at it this way, that this lady had given the very best that she could to Jesus Christ, and then someone would make the decision that Judas Iscariot just makes. I sit here and say how sad. How sad it is that, that, that he would make this decision right after all this good stuff had just happened. The next thing you see after you get past the word then, you see one of the twelve. One of the twelve. Folks, it was one of the twelve. Oh, I know it's easy for us to just read those words and keep going, but whenever you actually pause to think about it, this was one of the twelve. One of the twelve that, that, were, that were chosen to walk with Jesus closer than anyone else could ever walk, that would spend time with him. Folks, you need to know that, that being th this phrase, one of the twelve, meant that he was with Jesus for over three years, every day and every night. Folks, it, it wasn't just passing. You see, whenever you, whenever you think of it being one of the twelve, because other people would come and go, there would be people that would follow, but not the twelve. The twelve were with him all of the time, and they're watching everything he does. They're listening to every story that he tells. They're seeing the miracles. They, they know, they, did you know that Judas knew the story of the, of the, of the widow's mind? He was there. Judas knew when Christ turned the tables over. He was there. He was one of the twelve. But can I tell you all something else? It's much more than that. Folks, they spent every day together for three years. They were friends. They were friends. 
they had to have spent time around a campfire. Just the two of them, just sitting out there. Everyone else had fallen asleep, but Jesus and Judas just happened to be up that night. And they just talked. See, whenever it says that it's one of the twelve, These two had had one-on-one talks. They were friends. And had spent all this time together. And I sat here and said, how sad. How sad it is. How sad it is that Judas would do this to one of his friends. You keep reading. You keep reading inside the text. You see the word then, and then you see it's one of the twelve. And you notice this, the next three words called Judas Iscariot. Folks, people say that the most important uh, words that you will ever hear are your own name. Judas Iscariot. I can only imagine that whenever Judas was born, his mom and dad looked at him and thought, ah, we want to give this boy a good, strong name. And they talked about what name they were going to give him, and they give him the name Judas. How special he was going to be. Folks, isn't it amazing whenever you hear your name? What happens if whenever you hear your name? What, what does it cause you to do? Smile? perk your ears up. The other day I was at lunch with somebody, and I am telling you, somebody at another table kept talking about somebody by the name of Josh. I actually thought I heard him say Josh Ramsey, and guess what? What did I do? Well, I'm right in the middle of a conversation. What did I do? I turned my head. Do you know that I turned my head every time I heard my name? They said my name four times, and every time it caused me to stop and look, and I knew they weren't talking about me. Well, I guess I don't know. They could have been talking about me. (laughs) Folks, your name is very special. The next thing you see inside this text is Judas Iscariot's name recorded. His name is written down to be, be recorded for everyone to see. He was one of the 12, and his name is written down here for everyone to see forever. And I sit here and say, how sad. How sad. How sad it is that, that, that the, the claim to fame, if you will, for Judas Iscariot is that his name is written as part of these two verses. That's where his name is written down. The next thing you see in verse number 15 of this text, it says, Judas says, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? I almost preached a message just about that sentence right there. Because you notice inside of that sentence, watch these words, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? I almost preached a message just about those words right there. But how sad it is that that Judas even says this sentence. Because what Judas is saying right there, Judas, who is one of the twelve, whose name has been written down here for all the world to see forever, Judas says this sentence, and what he's really saying there is, I am willing to sell my friendship. Tell me how much it's going to cost. I am willing to sell the three years that I have had following this man. Tell me what I can gain. I am willing to sell my soul. What will you pay me? You folks, whenever you look at it that way, how sad it is. How sad it is to think that he would willingly, willingly ask, how much will you pay me if I help you kill 
my friend. I'll tell you that if you were in Judas's uh, seat, you, you would probably think of the facts that Judas has before him. What, do, what are the facts that Judas has? One, he's just been like, a, uh, like been popped for the way that they responded to how they spent the, the oil or their, their attitude about the oil. Jesus has already just got on to them about uh, where that money went for the oil. Jesus has just said that, uh, uh, hey, I'm about to die. Judas knows that Jesus is about to die, and he also noticed, guess what? Whenever Jesus dies, there's still going to be somebody in power, right? And so what is Judas doing? He's picking sides. Well, he's already told me he's going to die. If he dies, there's going to be somebody in power. i got to work out something that's best for me. And so if you look at the facts, it's pretty easy for somebody to, to justify the actions. But I still sit here and say how sad it is that someone would ever think about doing something like this to a friend. That he's asking the question, how much would you pay me to turn over? How much would I personally gain to turn over the Son of God? Next thing I want you to notice and he counted out 30 pieces of silver. You talk about something that's sad. That Judas would see the life of Christ worth 30 pieces of silver. How much is 30 pieces of silver? Well, in Exodus chapter 21, verse 32, you can look at it later. Go look at it later. In Exodus chapter 21, verse number 32, it talks about if, if I have an ox and my ox kills the slave of someone else, then I have to pay that person for the slave. Guess how much I have to pay them for the slave? 30 pieces of silver. You see, the price that they put on the life of Jesus, the Son of God, was the exact price that they would have put on any slave during that day. How sad. How sad it is that that was the price. You know how much, uh, it's hard to tell how much that would be worth in today's, today's world, but th there are some calculations out there about how people come up with how much that amount would have been today. You know how much, it, the, the best calculation I could come up with? I'll just tell you. I don't want you to have to guess. $197.70. It wasn't much. $197.70. They counted out $197.70 and said, this is what we will pay you to betray your best friend or your friend. You see, as I told you, whenever I started looking at this 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 text, I started saying, folks, this might be the saddest passage in all of Scripture. I've broke it down for us to see what was going on, and then, I, and then I had to ask myself this question, but what does this mean to us? What does this mean to us? Okay, okay, Josh, we see about how, how sad this is, but, but, and you broke down this passage, but what does it mean to us? Well, the first thing I want you to think about is this. Judas had walked with Jesus for how long? At least three years, three and a half years, maybe. But he had been with Jesus for, for three, and, three to three and a half years. And, and during that time, he spent every day with Jesus, <coughs> going from place to place, wherever Jesus went, spending time with Jesus, uh, going, going and watching the miracles of Jesus. And he walked with Jesus all day, every day, for three and a half years. Amen? Do you know what that means to us? He showed up to church. Right? Y'all follow me? Wait just a minute. It means that he would have considered himself a going to church type of person. Went to where Jesus is. You see... He would, have been, he would have been somebody who would have shown up for church. He attended church. He probably even gave to the church. If it were today, he would have been given to the church. He might have been a Sunday school teacher. He might have even came on Wednesday night to our Bible study. 
Folks, he might actually be in one of our Sunday school teachers. Can I tell you, he might have even been ordained as a deacon. You see, whenever you actually think about who, who Judas was, he was somebody who, who was one of the twelve. He was in the crowd, folks. He was, he was in the group. He attended church. He was with Jesus regularly. Some of us come to church regularly. We show up. We go hand out blankets. We go to Sunday school. So did Judas. So did Judas. But see, Judas, in fact, I was reminded as I was thinking about this and how sad it is, I was reminded of Matthew chapter 7, verse number 22, where it says inside of God's word, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And these people will say, but we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We've done all these wonderful works in your name. And what will Jesus say? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Folks, let me tell you something. There are lots of warnings to people who attend church that show up the same way that, Jesus, uh, that Judas showed up for three years. There's a lot of warnings for us to say this. Guess what? You might be showing up, but you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That was Judas's problem. He, he would show up, but folks, he did not ever surrender his life to Jesus Christ. In fact, whenever I, whenever I thought about this, how sad it would be if there was ever anyone that would, that would be attending church so often and never really know who Jesus Christ is. They never surrendered their life. They would show up, and that was it. In fact, let me tell you something. If that is you, you are no different than Judas Iscariot himself in that way. Showing up regularly, but never surrendering your life. Can I tell you something? If that is you, you will spend an eternity in hell, the same place where Judas Iscariot will spend eternity. How sad. How sad. The next thing that, remember, that I pointed out was his name. His name was Judas Iscariot. It's written down there for all the world to see. It's written down for all the world to see for eternity. It's written down there so that forever and ever we will know who Judas Iscariot is. His name has been written down. Folks, it reminded me of this. Flip over this. Let's do this. Let's flip over to Revelation chapter 20. I want to show you two verses in Revelation. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 15. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into a lake of fire. You see, Judas' name was written down. And it's written down for eternity for everyone to see. There's another place that you need to make sure that your name is written down. It's in the book of life. In fact, look at this verse. Look at uh, uh, chapter 21, verse 27. Flip over to verse, just flip the page, chapter 21. Look at what it says in verse number 27. But there shall by no means enter in to, and it's talking about heaven, that, def that defiles it, or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those whose are written in the Lamb's book of life. Only The only ones that are going to get into heaven are the ones whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life of life folks let me tell you judas iscariot's name was written down forever for everyone to see the question is this is your name written down in the book of life because folks if it is not you want to hear something that's really sad then you will spend an eternity cast into a lake of fire 
the exact place where Judas Iscariot is. How sad. You see, whenever, whenever I look at, at what has gone on here inside this, and I start thinking about how, how sad it is, this text that we look at, I actually have to ask myself this question. I wonder how many people here would say, Josh, I have never been saved. Judas didn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Oh, he, he would show up for church, but he didn't know him as Lord and Savior. His name was written down here for all the world to see. The question is, is your name written down in the book of life so that God will see? The last thing I want you to notice is this. Go back to our text. Go back to our text in Matthew. Remember, Judas asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And he asked this to the chief priests. I was thinking maybe, maybe we should change it around because how much were they willing to pay? 30 pieces of silver, $197.70. I wonder if we should change that around and say this, Jesus Christ, how much are you willing to pay for me? How much is he willing to pay for you? How much was Jesus Christ willing to pay for you? I will tell you how much he played. He pay, played, paid with the holy, precious blood of Jesus Christ himself. The cost, the amount that was paid for you was so much more than what they were willing to pay for him to be turned over. You see, this text, whenever we look at it, how sad this text might be. And we look at Judas Iscariot. And it's easy for us to sit here in judgment of, of Judas and what Judas did. But folks, can I tell you something? If you end up in the exact same place that Judas Iscariot does, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Jesus Christ was willing to pay his own life so that you could be delivered unto God. That your name would be written down in the book of life. Maybe you've been showing up to church You've been going through the motions. Maybe it's even been for three years or three and a half years or 10 years or 50 years, but you've never truly surrendered your life to Christ. In fact, you know that you have no relationship with him. I'm not going to tell you that you would betray him the same way that Judas did, but I will tell you this, you will end up in the same place that Judas did. So here's my question today. I want everyone to do this. I want you to pause for just a moment. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I truly saved? Do I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? Or have I just been putting on a show the same way that Judas did? Folks, if, you, if you've just been putting on a show, then I'm going to tell you right now that Jesus Christ paid for your life. He wants you to be saved. He wants everyone to come to glory. And if you're willing to do that, then I would ask that during this time of invitation that you would just come and that you would let me share with you what it means to be saved. It's pretty simple. It's repenting of your sin giving your life to Christ, turning away from your sin, giving your life to Christ, letting him be Lord and Savior of your life. Come and let me share with you what that looks like, what that feels like. Because it would be, the saddest story would be if you walked out of here and you never gave your life to Christ and you ended up the same place with Judas. If you will, please rise. Father, Lord God, I ask you a move during this time of invitation.
may you be glorified. Father, if there's anyone here that does not know you, will you move in their life? Oh, Father, I ask that you would move people today to have a deeper walk with you. Oh, Father, the importance of it. We ask that you will move. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Move however God has led you. where Judas is scary to child of God, then please go share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody, because it would be really sad if somebody that you know ever died and went into eternity and you never shared the love of Christ with them. Amen? That would be a sad story. And let's join hands with your families as we sing, as you, with your family as we sing Family of God. And I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God I've been washed in the fountain and cleansed by his blood and joined heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod for I'm part of the family the family of God 